Thank you, Dr. Ramirez, Dr. Letter. Thank you all very much for this opportunity. Uh, I've been here for quite some time and know many of you. And uh, uh, like Dr. Arnold once said, it's pretty apropos, and I have to use it as well, too. I feel that I've learned so much from all of you, and I feel like I'm a better physician now from what I've learned from all of you. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to go ahead and talk about Ebola. Uh, first of all, I have no disclosures. Our objectives today are going to be uh, to discuss what is the Ebola virus. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about the history of Ebola, understand transmission of Ebola. We'll know what the term person under investigation uh, means, and also we're going to understand how to control the spread of the Ebola virus. Uh, so let's first start off with a case. Uh, Laura C. is a 28-year-old female missionary who presents to the emergency department with complaints uh, of fevers, chills, and general fatigue over the last two to three days. She returned from a trip to Central Africa where she was helping with burials approximately one week ago. Her symptoms have been present for 48 hours prior to her arrival to the emergency room. And the question is, should she be isolated for possible Ebola virus disease? So first, a little background. Uh, Ebola virus disease is a rare and deadly disease. It occurs in both people and non-human primates. It, the virus itself can damage blood vessels and also can affect organs. Uh, it often leads to excessive bleeding, and it's caused by a group of viruses within the genus of Ebola virus. The International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, they authorized and organized the taxonomic classification and nomenclature for viruses. And according to them, the Ebola virus, it's in the family of the Philodoverdi. The genus uh, is Ebola virus and has a couple other viruses, the Marburg and the Cuba virus as well. And the species of the Ebola virus are the Thai forest, rest in Sudan, Bunibugyo, and Zaire. The uh, Zaire, Sudan, Thai forest, and Bunibugyo viruses cause disease in human beings, whereas the rest in virus only causes disease in pigs and non-human primates. No human disease from the rest in, uh, rest in uh, species. So history about Ebola. Uh, it first appeared in 1976. There were two simultaneous outbreaks at the time. The first one is an area in Africa known as Nazra in the South Sudan, and the other was in Yambuka in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, or the DRC. Uh, it occurred in a village near the Ebola River, and that's where the disease actually got its name. The initial outbreak affected 318 people. It caused 280 deaths, with a mortality rate of 90%. Uh, of interest, uh, I found that uh, they interviewed one of the original investigators uh, a few years back, and he talked about what happened was they, uh, he gave the story about a schoolmaster who had bought uh, some uh, wild meat at a market and went home and butchered the meat. And what in that sense happened was over the next few days, the schoolmaster came down with nosebleeds and dysentery. So then he presented to his uh, clinic slash hospital area. And uh, in there, um, he went to the uh, sort of the outpatient part. He required an injection for his treatment. And unfortunately, at the, uh, at the facility, they only had four needles, four syringes, and that was all. They uh, did not uh, practice any kind of sterilization procedure because they didn't know. So the schoolmaster got his injection, and then they immediately took the needles and syringes to the maternity ward and without sterilization and used it on the people that needed injections there. Over the next several days, uh, a lot of the patients became acutely ill, and then following that, a lot of the workers started becoming ill. And eventually they had to close that hospital area 
And that sort of sparked the initial outbreak. Now, since this, since this discovery in 1976, the Ebola virus has been affecting several countries in Africa, primarily Central, Central Africa. The 2014 through 2016 outbreak in West Africa was the largest that occurred since the initial outbreak. It started in Guinea and spread across the borders to Sierra Leone and eventually Liberia. It was uh, found to be the Zaire Ebola, Zaire Ebola virus species. At that time, over 28,000 people uh, were affected uh, with uh, over 11,000 deaths and a death rate of about 39%. Now, during that outbreak, with regards to the United States, there were actually four reported cases here. Uh, there was one death that did occur. Now, during the West African outbreak, 11 people were treated in the U.S., and the majority of those people uh, were infected in Africa and evacuated to the U.S. for treatment. However, there was one person that traveled commercial airline from Africa to the United States. And uh, you all may remember he landed in Dallas, Texas. And uh, from there, he uh, actually uh, he, uh, reportedly did not have any symptoms initially while on the plane. However, shortly after arriving, he began having symptoms. He presented to his local emergency room. Uh, they essentially discharged him home. Uh, a few days later, however, they did recall him and tested him and found out that he was positive for the Ebola virus. Two nurses taking care of this patient contracted Ebola virus disease. This marked the first time of Ebola virus disease transmission within the United States. But both nurses did recover. After this incident, the CDC collaborated with uh, U.S. Customs, Homeland Security, and local state and public health departments uh, to come up with a way to screen travelers and also to provide safe transport for those being assessed for Ebola virus disease. Uh, also, they worked to strengthen preparedness uh, and, and infection control practices within hospitals. So since 1976, as I previously mentioned, there have been outbreaks over the last 40 some odd years. Uh, this graph I got from the CDC shows the areas where outbreaks took place. Uh, the colors uh, correlate with the, with the uh, species of the uh, Ebola virus and the numbers of the, or should I say the circumference of those circles correspond to the number of cases uh, that did occur. We are currently in the midst of an outbreak of Ebola. Uh, the current outbreak began August 1st of 2018. The ministry in the uh, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, or the DRC, declared an outbreak when four individuals tested positive for the Ebola virus. Now, presently, that, well, uh, at that time, excuse me, 2018, it was centered in the northeast portion of the country uh, in uh, North Kivu and the Atura provinces. And uh, as of November 15th, the latest numbers I have, and I'm sure those numbers have changed because they almost changed daily, uh, almost 3,300 cases with almost to uh, 2,200 total deaths and uh, approaching 1,100 survivors. Transmission of the virus. Uh, scientists believe that, it's used, that this is a zoonosis. It's an animal-borne virus. Uh, bats are the more likely source of the reservoir for this Ebola virus. And it can transmit it to the animals, apes, and monkeys, and other humans. This graph, uh, this illustration I got from the World Health Organization, sort of, sort of, sort of shows where if you look at the bat, he uh, kind of comes down and interacts with the animals there. And the dotted line represents an, a very inconsistent but possible contact with human beings. But more likely what would happen is the animals, well, you, and it, you'll see in my next illustration, this will make a little more sense, the, the humans interact with the animals uh, and then they usually end up consuming uh, their carcasses 
Uh, and from that point, the human becomes infected. Uh, and also at that point, that's when you begin to have human-to-human transmission. Um, I like this illustration a lot better. I think it's a little, a little simpler. Uh, the bats interact with the uh, animals there. Uh, the, the hunter there has killed uh, uh, one of the animals for food, so he goes and butchers it. But unfortunately, uh, it, if it's an infected animal, then he can become ill. And you, that's actually considered a spillover event. Uh, then the human-to-human uh, uh, -human transmission occurs when you have someone taking care of that ill person, they come in contact with their blood and body fluids, or if you have an unprotected health care worker, this can happen. And finally, some of the traditional funeral practices there uh, result in exposure as well. Now, if there's somebody who does survive the Ebola virus disease, uh, usually they have a very long road to recovery, and I'll get into specifics of that in just a moment. But um, in addition to feeling tired, sluggish, and muscle aches, there's also stigma associated with the survivors as well, too. Um, a lot of people don't want to really be associated with that person because this person has been exposed to Ebola. Sort of similar to um, some of the reactions that, uh, that, uh, that occurred when HIV was initially discovered and people not want to really be associated because they just didn't want to be around uh, this person that was infected. So transmission, um, the way the virus is transmitted, is transmitted through broken skin or through the mucous membranes of the uh, nose, of, I'm sorry, of the eyes, nose, and mouth. So contact with an infected animal, body fluids of a person who is sick or has died of Ebola virus disease, or even contact with objects that are contaminated with the virus allow for transmission. The most important points, however, are the Ebola virus cannot be spread person to person until one develops signs or symptoms of the disease. A person with Ebola may not show signs and symptoms immediately, and this is actually known as the incubation period. Uh, symptoms can appear anywhere from 2 to 21 days. Uh, the average is usually, they say, 8 to 10 days. So as far as diagnosis, uh, there has got to be a combination of symptoms suggestive of Ebola virus disease along with a possible exposure to Ebola virus disease within 21 days before onset of symptoms. Now, the symptoms, signs and symptoms that can occur uh, are listed here on the right, fever, fatigue, diarrhea, anorexia, et cetera. Um, there was a study done uh, in 2014 uh, in Nigeria, and they actually went through the frequency of the more common symptoms that occur. And fever appeared to be over 90% present uh, when, with regards to frequency of symptoms, followed closely by fatigue and then diarrhea and so on and so forth there. Now, the symptoms, uh, if they're, once they're present, uh, and, they've, and if they've been present for a while, the disease can actually escalate. And when it does, that's when you begin to see impaired uh, renal and liver function. And even in some cases, with, with the escalation, you may have internal and external bleeding, for example, from the gums or blood and stool. Now, so those are the signs and symptoms. Now, the exposure part of this, the exposure includes possible contact with blood or body fluids from a person who is sick or one that's died from Ebola virus disease. Also, exposure to the objects contaminated with blood or body fluids from a person who's been sick or has died from Ebola virus disease. In addition, contact with infected fruit bats or primates, as I pointed out in my illustration uh, earlier, uh, 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 is considered also a con uh, a contact. And also, semen from a man who has recovered from Ebola virus disease, all these are exposures 
they can occur. So what about laboratory tests? Well, a person, again, who's had symptoms of Ebola plus the exposure within 21 days before the onset of symptoms should be tested for Ebola virus disease. Now, the tests that are available, uh, there is a PCR, reverse transcriptase uh, polymerase chain reaction, that, uh, it, which is a molecular test, and it looks for the RNA uh, of the Ebola virus, because the Ebola virus is an, is an RNA virus. Uh, that's a point of care test. Um, there's also an antigen test. They come in two forms. One is a point of care rapid antigen test, uh, and the other one is a laboratory antigen test that's usually performed within the laboratory by lab workers. Uh, and both of these detect antigens uh, of Ebola in blood samples. The third test is more of an ELISA test because it actually tests for antibodies uh, that develop in response to infection. Uh, and again, as far as the escalation part, um, if you were to have labs drawn, they would show uh, in, during the escalation period low white blood cell counts and also low platelet counts and possibly uh, elevations of transaminases and creatinine. Okay, so um, now these, these persons that uh, do present with acute fever, uh, there are other possible causes. Uh, we talk in infectious disease uh, when we talk about fever and a returning traveler, malaria is always our top diagnosis. But again, given this situation, it's, it's also a consideration, even if those people presenting and they actually have Ebola, but still we consider differential diagnosis malaria. Also, influenza, dysentery, and depending upon the clinical situation, uh, dengue, chikungunya, and typhoid fever are considerations. And then at the very bottom, these are uh, other, uh, other diseases that are also in consideration. And usually it's your infectious disease specialist who will uh, be doing more investigation of uh, these other possibilities. Okay, diagnosis. So if a person is presenting with symptoms of, a, of, of acute illness, fever, weakness, fatigue, and then uh, if they've escalated to the point where they have low white blood cell counts and low platelets and elevated transaminases, and they have a possible exposure to Ebola virus disease within 21 days of the onset of symptoms, in addition, in addition to considering all the differential diagnosis, anyone with early signs and symptoms of this and a possible exposure should be isolated. Um, and these are people that we consider are we, we coined the term persons under investigation. Uh, they're separated from people they're, that is, again, they're isolated and public health officials are notified. Uh, as far as treatment goes, supportive care is the mainstay of, of treatment uh, with, Ebola, uh, with Ebola virus disease. Now, this does include aggressive IV fluid and electrolyte replacement. In addition, oxygen therapy to maintain adequate oxygen saturations, blood pressure control, reducing vomiting and diarrhea, and also manage fever and pain and treating any other infections that may be occurring. When we talk about prevention, um, Prevention of focuses on avoiding contact with the virus itself. So we try to recommend avoiding areas of known outbreaks. Uh, anybody that may be there, we tell them to wash their hands frequently. In addition, uh, we ask people to avoid bushmeat. And in developing countries there, avoid buying or eating wild animals, including the non-human primates. And these are actually sold in the local markets there. In addition, you want to avoid contact with infected people, particularly the caregivers uh, should avoid contact with infected persons, uh, blood and body fluids, and also the tissues, including blood, semen, saliva, and urine. 
um, they should follow infection control procedures and don't and with the the people who have died uh, it's highly recommended that they don't actually bury the person themselves but they actually have special uh, specifically organized uh, groups and teams that put on protect, protective gear and will actually uh, appropriately dispose of the remains. Okay, so what about vaccines? Well, at this time, worldwide, there are 15 vaccines being developed. Uh, right now, there are two, there are the two most advanced vaccines are the chimpanzee adenovirus 3 based vaccine. And the more common one is the recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus based, based vaccine. And right now, these two, vac the, the, these two vaccines are in phase two and three trials. But um, understand that at present, there are no licensed vaccines against Ebola virus. But the, um, uh, the uh, recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus vaccine is actually being used presently uh, in, this, in this outbreak now that is occurring. Um, the uh, a European, uh, European Federation, uh, sort of, are sort of their, uh, the equivalent to the FDA here in, in the United States. They have allowed for the use of the vaccine and right now it's being used under uh, compassionate use criteria. But uh, they are using the vaccine now uh, uh, in the DRC. Now, this vaccine has been shown to be safe and protective against the Zaire strain of Ebola virus, and it's recommended by the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization uh, for the use of uh, the Ebola outbreaks uh, caused by that Zaire strain. And although uh, the vaccine has actually been shown to be about 90% effective, um, and despite this, um, and, and the vaccine has been proven so far to be safe and protective against the Ebola virus, still more scientific research is needed before it can actually be licensed. But again, they are using it presently now in the DRC. And as I mentioned, it's uh, being used on a compassionate basis. Now, there's some, there are some investigational studies going on. Uh, presently, there are no approved medications for the treatment of Ebola virus or for the use in post-exposure prophylaxis in persons who've been exposed to Ebola virus. But several therapies um, uh, have been administered, either alone or in combination. Uh, and again, some of these are being given, uh, had, had been given on a compassionate use basis. Most, were, however, were found to be of no, or some, or no of unclear benefit and are no longer being investigated. Um, what about monoclonal antibodies? Well, uh, they've been evaluated in animal studies using primates. Now, the REGN-EB3, which is more of a cocktail, if you will, because it consists of three monoclonal antibodies, uh, and it does provide potent virus neutralization. Also, the ZMAP is another cocktail as well. Uh, it targets the uh, 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 surface glycoproteins of the Ebola virus. Uh, the GS5734 is a nucleotide analog. Again, all of these are still under investigation. Okay, so what about survival? So as I mentioned before, a person infected with Ebola virus disease is, will be contagious when symptoms first appear, and they remain contagious while they're symptomatic. And even if death occurs, the individual does remain contagious. If, however, an individual does survive Ebola, uh, the person remains contagious for approximately 21 to 42 days after the symptoms abate. Now, those survivors, uh, they do develop antibodies. They can last 10 years, possibly longer. We're unfortunately not sure. And it's also not known if people will recover 
or people who recover, if, if they stay immune for life or if they could become infected with a different species of the Ebola virus. Now, for those people who do survive, as I mentioned back when I was talk, talking about the illustration, it is a long, difficult road back for them. And they have issues such as hair loss, sensory changes in hands and feet, along with weakness, fatigue, uh, headaches, uh, eye inflammation, and males can have testicular inflammation. Also, these patients can have psychiatric, psychiatric issues, including anxiety, depression, and PTSD. But again, these are with the survivors uh, of the Ebola virus disease. So, if we go back to our case, okay, Laura, who, again, is a missionary presented to the emergency uh, department with complaints of fevers, chills, and general fatigue over, or so I say, for the past two to three days. She returned from a trip to Central Africa where she was helping with burials uh, about a week ago, and her symptoms uh, have been present for 48 hours prior to her admission to the emergency room. So, again, the question, should she be isolated for possible Ebola virus disease? How many say, how many say no? <laughs> how many say yes? All right, very good. Taught you something today. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, just so you know, Kentucky has an Ebola response plan. And the uh, Kentucky's response to Ebola has been coordinated with, well, with both the CDC and Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. And their response is uh, they um, want to monitor travelers from Ebola-affected countries, identify Ebola assessment hospitals, develop a statewide plan uh, and a collaborated plan with states in our region um, and develop a comprehensive regional response plan to prepare for Ebola. Uh, just so you know, we are sort of, I think we're in region four and uh, uh, we're in the uh, same region as Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, ten and Tennessee, and we are in Kentucky. So that's our region. Now, um, the overall uh, uh, goal is to isolate a person who's under investigation, uh, contacting people who have been exposed to this person under investigation, uh, close monitoring of contacts, and then further isolation of these contacts if they develop symptoms. Um, so at some of the other hospitals, and this is uh, from the VA, for example, we have signs posted um, and people who are presenting uh, with acute febrile illness, for example. Um, someone will ask, or again, the signs are posted, if you've traveled to West, Af West Central or South Africa in the last 21 days and have had close contact with anyone who has and you have the uh, following symptoms, what happens is they alert a staff member immediately. They are actually uh, given a mask and a, they're put in isolation for uh, further evaluation. And uh, this is, for the VA, for example, this happens both in the emergency department and the outlying clinics as well. Uh, these next couple slides are sort of busy slides, but I'll basically try to summarize. So um, this is how a person is handled as they present with these symptoms. Um, what happens is uh, that person is isolated, as I initially said, and um, the, uh, usually the uh, emergency room or the clinic, they will notify the health department, who will in turn notify uh, the uh, uh, regional epidemiologist who is on call for Frankfurt 24 hours a day. Uh, they sort of have a conference call, if you will, and they talk about this person under investigation. And then uh, through, uh, through deliberation and answering of specific questions, they make a determination uh, about this person under investigation. 
Uh, and if they determine that, yes, this person uh, could be exposed or could have had exposure to Ebola virus disease, then they're transported to what's called an Ebola assessment hospital. And for the hospitals in, in our city, uh, the University of Louisville is the Ebola assessment hospital. So in essence, they would, uh, the state would make arrangements for a special ambulance to come and transport this person to the university. Uh, once arriving, this person under investigation is actually placed into isolation. And when they're, after being evaluated, uh, usually by the emergency physician, uh, it's, um, it's determined if the person uh, needs laboratory testing. And if so, then the laboratory tests are done. The samples are put in the appropriate containers. Uh, the state police are notified, and they give these samples to the state police who take them to Frankfurt to be tested uh, for Ebola virus. Uh, if it turns out those tests are positive, then the state, um, along with CDC and other regional agencies, uh, will make arrangements for this person that has been under investigation, who's now tested positive for the Ebola virus. They will be transferred to what's called an Ebola treatment center. And for our region, it's uh, Emory University uh, in Atlanta, Georgia and they will make arrangements to be transferred there. And as I mentioned, University of Louisville Hospital is the Ebola assessment hospital in this region. Okay, so uh, recently we did an Ebola drill here at the University of Louisville. And uh, what we did was we actually had a person actually come in, not necessarily transferred, but come into the hospital uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the risk, or should I say, with the acute symptoms and possible exposure. So immediately, when that person was determined that they could be at risk for Ebola virus disease, they were isolated and given a mask and uh, have their own, uh, this particular uh, 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 case, uh, they were placed in the, de in the decontamination room. So it was determined that uh, blood would need to be drawn. So um, the nurses who had been trained uh, in putting on uh, protective, uh, pers personal protective equipment, or PPEs, they uh, began uh, uh, donning on their, uh, their attire. And, and uh, after doing so, um, uh, placed on all their attire, uh, they had uh, they were placed in their pappers, uh, which allow for ventilation, and they actually went in to uh, evaluate the patient. Now, in the photograph on the left, um, the nurse uh, where it's, the nurse is drawing the blood. That area is considered the hot zone. The other nurse, who's ready to collect the materials, is considered in the warm zone. And once the uh, laboratories are drawn and placed in appropriate containers and decontaminated there and then given to the other nurse, they're packaged uh, in the special equipment, uh, and then those will be transported by state police again uh, to the lab in Frankfurt. Now, fast forward to the determination has been made, yes, this person uh, has Ebola virus disease. Well. The, uh, uh, the EMS people, they're in the yellow, yellow isolation uh, 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 PPEs. Uh, they are actually ready to move the patient over to uh, their gurney and then take to their ambulance and then to transport uh, to, uh, to Georgia. So you notice how they have them wrapped up, uh, wrapped up like a burrito. And uh, that way there's no blood, body fluids, uh, because Sometimes these people may be vomiting, they may have diarrhea. Uh, so, but you're wrapping them up and then uh, transporting them over. And then from there, from there, they put into the ambulance and then uh, either 
uh, either driven down or taken to an airport and then sent to, uh, to Georgia. So, in conclusion, Ebola is a rare and deadly disease. It's spread by direct contact through broken skin or mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, and mouth with blood, body fluids of a person who is sick or has died from Ebola virus disease. A person under investigation, well, I'm sorry, a person who has symptoms of acute viral disease uh, that manifests within 21 days of traveling to an outbreak area and has had contact with someone who's had Ebola virus disease is considered a person under investigation and should be evaluated for Ebola virus disease. Early recognition, isolation, and treatment are critical in, in controlling the spread of Ebola virus disease. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. Um, before I, I open it up for questions, I have a couple of my own. Um, so does the virus, um, I mean, can you cook the meat and the virus is still okay? I mean, when you said avoid bush meat. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is that you said that men after who are survivors mm -hmm. can still have the virus in their semen. Is yes. It forever? No. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I believe uh, it, they, they still say with, for within 21 to 42 days, they still can be contagious like that. So, yeah, so it definitely is present uh, up to at least six weeks. Uh, and with your first question, um, I don't, I don't think any studies have been done on actually cooking the meat and testing for virus. But we just consider that once, you know, once in the blood, and, and if the people are actually doing the butchering themselves, which they normally do, they ingest it, and uh, they are the ones that are most likely to come down uh, with it. Let me, let me uh, uh, remember the, the nurse that had the meat was like this one year after the war. Yes, uh-huh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, they, uh, the, yeah, the virus, we really don't know how long it stays, but uh, there was a case, actually that was a physician, who actually had the Ebola virus in his eye. And you could actually see, uh, and his eye had changed from, from blue to green. And it was actually in his eye when they tested him. So, yeah, so it, it can persist um, for an indeterminate amount of time. Because, because they got the hemocephalitis and they, they, they culture the virus. They identify the virus one year after you were infected. Hmm. Yeah. This is the stuff of blockbusters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're frightened. You mentioned, oh, uh, you mentioned that, that uh, the contact with, uh, with materials that being with the virus, mm -hmm. how long the virus can survive outside of a human? <laughs> okay, uh, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on the environment of the virus. Okay, they've actually done studies. Um, they've taken the virus and they have put it at room temperature with normal humidity. They found that the virus can survive up to about 11 days in the, that kind of environment. But now if you look at the environment in Africa, 80 degrees and, and extremely high humidity, uh, if it's left on surfaces there, the virus only dis only survives about maybe three days. Only three days. As opposed to eleven. <laughs> um, also, they also they also they did studies. They they looked at they they looked at the virus in both dried blood and liquid blood. Dried blood, uh, they determined it, it would live for about maybe five days, whereas in liquid blood, maybe twice that long. What's interesting and hasn't really been determined, now if the virus actually gets in water, it's not known how long it survives because if it gets in water and gets in water systems, we don't know how long it survives. And you know, it, it, that could be a potential mode, potential of transmission. But uh, in general, when you talk about, uh, like I said, I, I actually saw a report once where someone was, uh, was on a plane and they were wondering, well, how long is it gonna survive on, let's say, like a seat or armrest. Um, again, uh, if standard cleaning procedures are done, then the virus actually uh, uh, gets eliminated, and there's, uh, there's been, there actually has been any transmission or any, any cases known or shown to transmit the virus 
uh, from a casual, expo a casual possible exposure like that. So it looks like there have been um, mortality statistics that you mm -hmm. show that mm -hmm. range anywhere from about 30% to mm -hmm. 90%. Mm -hmm. And what are the factors that account for that massive difference you know, in survival? Sure. Well, I, I believe if if you if you think back to the original the original exposure, uh, and the death rate was ninety percent. Remember that we're talking nineteen seventy six. We're talking non sterilization of materials. Okay, and definitely uh, not non non or should I say no presence of uh, of uh, standard precautions such as wearing PPEs, wearing pappers, and things like that. I think uh, what we've learned over the years through all the outbreaks, especially the 2014 through 2016 outbreak, is that uh, uh, wearing the uh, personal protective uh, equipment along with the pappers for breathing, because those two nurses that got infected, they actually had on protective gear, but it wasn't to the, to the level of protection of what we have now. And so, yeah, they, they got, one nurse got infected. As a matter of fact, the one nurse actually sued the, uh, Texas, uh, the Texas Hospital Administration, citing that she wasn't properly trained on, 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 on isolation and taking care of the Ebola patients. I know that uh, in, uh, in my field, you know, there was a considerable amount of consternation because we do blood all the time. Um, and uh, the, uh, the group at Emory, the group okay. that actually developed the protocols for doing dialysis on okay. um, Ebola victims, should that should that happen? Um, mm -hmm. But as you can imagine, caused considerable consternation mm -hmm. uh, within the field as, how, as to how we were going to handle that uh, yeah. safely. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. I know it's hard, and we, we talked a little bit about the vaccine and how you begin to get that out into a population. I think, you know, you, you talk mm -hmm. about the cultural aspects and the, mm -hmm. the stigma, and so mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about what were the strategies that were used to get sure. the vaccine out to the, to the oh. population? In, in general, uh, they do what's called a ring, uh, ring, a ring strategy, and basically what that amounts to is you have the, you have the person, uh, they would immunize or vaccinate the contacts, and then they would vaccinate the contacts of the contacts, and possibly those contacts of those previous contacts. So if you think about it, and then, then it, it, it sort of looks like it's in a ring distribution. So that's actually how they're, how they're doing it. I, that's how they initially did it, initially did it. But uh, it was later decided that because there were so, so many other people that were not getting vaccinated, they decided, and this is based primarily from this, the European equivalent to the FDA. Uh, they decided, let's, uh, uh, number one, let's go ahead and, and, and approve use. Number two, let's use it under compassionate means. And three, let's just vaccinate as many people that come. 